Now we're on the top of Daf Memtes Omid Beis. The Ibois Ema was still trying to reconcile our Mishnah with all three sheepers of the Tanoim. So far, we were successful in reconciling our Mishnah with Rabbi Meir. Now we go on to Rabbi Yehud. Rabbi Yehud and Rabbi Yehud holds with the opposite Kavachomer, that if there's a mitzvah on a father to support his daughters, how much more, excuse me, his sons, how much more so his daughters, where there's an issue of nivel, of zilusa, of undermining her kavod, if the daughters have to knock on doors. And here's the way we're going to read the Mishnah. Even though in the case of the Bas, there's an issue of kavod, of zilzal, nevertheless, there's no obligation incumbent upon the father to support his daughters. Forget about Bizayon and the fact that she have to be, uh, what do you call it, Chose, Chose, Resal, Psochim. No, certainly, if he's not high and obligated to, to feed his, his daughters, certainly doesn't have to feed his sons. They don't have that issue of kavod. But now we go back to the diuk. Okay, there's no chiv, but ha mitzvah. There certainly is a mitzvah. Right? You get brownie points. You're a good Samaritan. Bibno Ika. I'm sorry, I lost it. One second. Oh. Now keep in mind that according to Rabbi Yudha, Bino is on the lower echelon vis-a-vis Bas, who's on a higher echelon because of the Kavod. Now you'll ask me the question, it sounds like only in the case of Bito, there's an implicit diuk in the mitzvah that there's a mitzvah. When you, Rabbi Yudha, hold that even in the lower echelon, namely in Ben, there's also a mitzvah. You would have thought that in the case of Bito, because of the issue of Zilzal and Kavod, there is an absolute unconditional obligation. No, the mitzvah says there's no chol, but there is a mitzvah. And that mitzvah applies even in the case of Oni. Eboy say, well, let's see if we can work it out with the third honor of Yochanan and Broca, who's of the opinion that there's no mitzvah at all on the father, not vis a vis his daughters, nor vis a vis his sons. Here's the way we're going to read the Mishnah. Like we said before, Bas and Ben on the same level, and he has no obligation to support them. I, what about a mitzvah? No. We're going to interpret the Mishnah saying, We had Dindah Fil and Mitzvah Nami Lech. There's not even a Mitzvah. But wait a minute, you're undermining our whole reading, our whole understanding of the Mishnah. The Mishnah says there's no Choma, implying that there is a Mitzvah. Where according to Rabbi Yochum and Broker, there is no Mitzvah. Which is hard to imagine, but that's Rabbi Yochum and Broker. Ah, the answer is that the Mishnah went out of its way to tell us that that um, although there is a chova through the ksuba to support the banos, even after the father's death, in which case his estate was transferred over to the heirs, the male sons, nevertheless, they cannot block the access of the daughters, the females, to receive Mizonos from that estate. The Aidi de Bonos Liachem Risoson Avien Chovo. Since the Mishnah wants to, wants to teach us that after the death of the father is a Chovo, and therefore the male children who are heirs cannot block that Chovo to support the Mizonos of the Bonos, is Tonanami Eno Chayev. Now, when he walks, the, uh, when he when the Mishnah wants to talk about the Bechaya Av, when the father is alive, he tells that there's no chiv. But really, what he means is, when Rabbi Yochum and Rokin, there's no mitzvah. Rabbi Yehuda ben Chanin Bar Chanina. 
According to this transmission in Ula, in Usha, where the Sanhedrin was Gola, when it left the Luchka Sagazis, and if I remember correctly, it was there for 40 years. I don't know if he points that out here. Let's just see. Yeah. First it went to Mokoma Somach Leharabayis. And then later on, it went with the Nasi. And then it was Miskal in the Golos, who was finally at the time of Rabbi Ram Gamliel. And the Sanhedrin went to Usha. Later on, it seems that Rabbi Gamliel uh, moved to Yavna, and that's when the Sanhedrin went back to Yavna. Okay. So what was the Takana, the injunction that was instituted in Ucha, that a man has to support his young children not as a chova, because as we established clearly, there's no chiv to support your children, but through takonos chachov mischayv b'mezonos bonavaktanim. Until they become gedolim, meaning until they have shtei saros and shonim. Now he points out in the footnote that the word ketanim here comes to the exclusion of what's called katne ketanim. So there's ketanim between the ages of six and bar mitzvah, and then there's ketane ketanim, which are lower than shish, less than six years old. And with regard to that, even without the takonis usha, there's an absolute obligation on the father to support his young children up to the age of six. And the whole issue that we're going to learn, whether we accept Usha's Takana, we don't accept Usha's only vis-a-vis children who are Ketanim, meaning above the age of six, but before Gathas. Have we accepted La Locha, this transmission, this Takana of, of Usha? If we do, if, if the Takan of Ucha, the Sanhedrin in Usha was accepted, then if a man would be accused of not supporting his children, then we're going to beat him up, so to speak. We'll force him to support his children. But if we didn't accept La Locha, this Takan of the Sanhedrin of Ucha, then although it would be a mitzvah for him to support his children, haktanu, we cannot force him to do so because it's not a chov. How do we pass it? Toshma. The kiavi also would come to Rabbi Yehuda. They had cases that came in front of Rabbi Yehuda of fathers who refused to support their children. That your children were Ketanim. Amalahu and Rabbi Yehuda would say to them, oh, This is a marshal. Yorod Yolda Vyabne Mosa Shadia. So something called a Yorod, which he translates it as a Tanin. A Tanin is like a, a very large animal. You know, back in the day, like a dinosaur or something like that. Gave birth. Instead of supporting his own children, he says, let the, you know what they call it, usually the kupata ear, you're familiar with that? You know, let, let, let the community chest support my children. And it means that their relationship towards their children is achzarius. It's cruelty. 
They have no compassion on their own children. And therefore, if Yehud is coming to give tochacha and gnai to those people who refuse to support their children, but apparently he did not have the authority to force them to support their children. That's called fear. That he didn't have, we normally have a principle called kofanal and mitzvah, but here we're not going to apply kofanal and mitzvah, meaning we do not accept the takon of usha. Another story. In this case, they came in front of a chizda. They refused to support their children. Amalahu, Rav Chizda said to them, now this is what we call public humiliation, which is really a, we, we know that Chazal tell us that and it's considered like I mean, Bucha, to cause some of Bucha is a terrible thing, but in this case, we're talking about a person who refuses to support his children. It's such cruelty. We have to go public about it. Take a certain kind of cooking utensil, turn it upside down, and stand on it and bang on it. You know, make a loud, a, a loud noise. The lakum and get this man who refused to support his children to stand on top of this overturned machteshes, machteshes where you grind the, 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 the wheat or whatever it is, the grains, the lema, and let him publicly humiliate himself and declare, Arva by B'nai, a raven will support his own offspring uh, who govern that man, referring to himself, low boy Benet, doesn't care about his children, publicly humiliated. This is Rashi's first shot. Rashi has the second shot is that the Shliach of Bezdin will get on top of this overturned Machteshes and make this announcement about such and such a person. But again, it's all a matter of tochach, of humiliating him. There was no kfir. They didn't actually force his hand and what do we call it today in, in, in Israel? We call it a nikul, right? They didn't put a nikul on his bank account because we don't accept la'alocha, the takon of Hulk Affecting a moral, what kind of business is this? An orev will support its children and now we have a little biological uh, uh, dig digression over here. Vaksim, we have a pasuk. I think it's in Tehillim. Let me just double. Uh, yeah. No saying. Lebehema lachma. Levnei orev asher yikro. The bnei orev, the children, the offspring of the raven, are not supported by their parents. And therefore God has to intervene and support them. A very strange way the Chazal say how this happens biologically. And God puts these insects that the Orev will swallow inside the feces. And that's how they'll support themselves. It's all part of a divine plan. And this is because the Bnei Orev don't have anyone to support them, to feed them. So we see clearly that the Orev is the model, the paradigm of, of cruelty. Sounds like Edgar Allan Poe. Okasha. Yeah, this is an unbelievable biological insight. I would love to Google it. And there's Uchme and there's Chivare. Chivare are the white ones and Uchme are the black ones. It sounds like we're talking about two different species of ravens. And the black ravens are are not going to support their children, their offspring, they're cruel. But the white ones are more magnanimous. But Rashi has a whole nother shot here. It has nothing to do with different species of ravens, but rather different age brackets of the offspring of the ravens. When the offspring is very young, its complexion is dark. 
And that's not like the older, more mature ravens that are white. So the male orev, when he sees the children, and they look black, dark skinned, and his complexion is light, he says, these are not my offspring. It was another orev who came along and you know, had this relationship. This is uh, this ain't my child. You know, imagine a white person goes to the cheder leidot, yeldot, and they point out, the cheder I should say, right? And they point out, hey, there's your child, but he's black. That can't be my child. But what happens is with the orev that during the course of its maturity, its complexion turns from black to white. So when the orevs, the bnei orev, are mature, they turn white. And then the father orev realizes that I fathered this child. And then his natural love for the child evolves and he supports the bnei orev. A person who refused to support his children, his young children came in front of Rava. Omale Rava would say to him, Even Musa, you want your children to be supported by the community chest? Once again, you see that Rava did not force the guy to shell out or, you know, put a... Uh, you know, a, con a confiscation order on his property. However, the Gemara makes a very radical change. Lo Amaron, when do we say that we don't accept the Takaris Uch and we cannot force him to support his children? That's only El Dlo Amid. It's not a wealthy God. Avil, if the father is Amid, he's a wealthy person. Kafina Leib Al Karche, we're going to force him and beat him up and confiscate his property if necessary to support his children because he's wealthy. And this is a reflection of the general principle called Kofin Alat Stoker, which is Paskin and Shulchan Aruch and Yoridea, that if a person refuses to give stock and he has the wherewithal to do so, then we will confiscate his property and his bank account if necessary to give stock. However, Tosis, the third Tosis, he has a different sheet. He says, you cannot take this Gemara literally that we force him to give stock a wine. We have a rule that a mitzvah shematan schara bitzida, if there's a mitzvah in the Torah and the Torah specifies what the reward will be, ain kofinale. We don't force a person to fulfill such a mitzvah. And stocker fits that profile because it says, in Kvarim Tesvav, Nason Titein Lo, Ki Beglal Ador Razei Yivarech Hashem Alokecha. God will bless you. I would add here, Aser B'Sfil Shetisaseh. Tishashim. So this is all a Gemara Chulid, Dav Kuf Yud, Kuf Yud Amit Beis, Mitzvah, Shabbat Nitzvah, Betzida, Ein Bezdin, uh, so Tosis comes up with a whole new shot in this Gemara where the Bnei Ha'ir got together and they indicated and enacted that a certain sum of money of stock has to be given by each one of the Bnei Ha'ir and tax, so to speak, for the stock or for the charity. Not a bad idea today. That would solve a lot of problems in shuls and schools. And therefore, we can force him to support um, the Tzedakah the organizations. However, most we've shown have learned against Tosus and Kofanala Tzedakah, and it's not considered Matan Scharmitz. That's how we pass it, Kofanala Tzedakah. Rava actually forced Ravi Oven who apparently was wealthy. And when they went down to take money from his account, 
you know, the Gizbarim or whoever they were. Apik Bidei Arba Meh Zuzi Litzdaka. At the end of the day, they ended up with 400 Zuz of a massive amount, sum of money for Litzdaka. They didn't give him a choice in the matter. Amar Rabbi Ila, Amar Rav Reish Lakish, be Ushas Kino, another Takana of Ucha, Hakosev called Nechasa of Libana. Imagine a man in his lifetime signs over all his money, all his bank accounts and his stocks and his bonds and his apartments, real estate, everything, the entire kit and caboodle, he signs it over to his son. Now, at this point, the son, or sons, it doesn't matter with singular or plural, make an absolute Kenyan. And yet, in Ula, they made a takana, who that he and his wife will still be supported by the estate, even though it really technically belongs to the bonnet. And if they're younger children, so forgetting about Yerusha, but just in terms of focusing on Mizonos, we will take from the Yerusha for the Mizonos. So as I said before, he's going to have a very fat, wealthy, you know, estate, all his assets in order for, in order for the son, right? He wrote, he wrote all his assets to his son. So what's his son going to end up with after you support him, the father and the wife, the mother and the children who are young children? What's he left with? Obviously, he was a very wealthy guy and he had a fat estate. Now, here there's a major machlokas, which is quoted here in the Mesifta between Rashi and Tosa on the one end and the Rash on the other. Rashi and Tosa holds that according to the strict letter of the law, he, the father, and his wife have no rights to that money once he wrote them all and transferred ownership over to his son. This is only a takar of uch. The Rashi, on the other hand, says Mikra Adin, Hotzal Samizonu Shalovich Al Ichdo. That's Mikra Adin. Why Omdin Daito Shib of Mali Lo Pasim Kol Nechasim? This is Umdina, and he didn't want to give away all his Nechasim so that he wouldn't have a penny to his name. So that what the Holche Usha really accomplished was they put a tenai, so to speak, a limitation and a restriction in his gift. And they said his gift is limited, such that he, the father, and his wife, etc., etc., could still be supported. Basically, the thrust of this attack against Rabbi Loy, the name Rich Lokish, is going to be I don't know why you bothered even telling me this. I could derive this from a Kalvachom. I have a bigger Kiddush, and your Kiddush is even less than a Kiddush. And that bigger Kiddush is based on something that we derive from, from the Chachamim. We'll see exactly how. But anyway, what is this bigger Kiddush? Now, I realize we only have about six minutes officially, so I'm going to ask Mechila because we're about to enter into a little bit of a sensitive, complicated issue, and we'll try to see. We may need an extra couple of minutes, so let's see how it goes. Okay. A man dies and leaves behind him a wife, an almana, and one child who's female. And the law is that if there are no sons, that's the parish of no slug, but then his daughters, in this case, he only has one daughter, will inherit his property. But what that means is that his almana is out in the cold. So the answer is that from a Yerusha, we will support a wife, an almana. Fine. So far, so good. So the daughter inherits her father, the entire state. 
but there's a locha of mizonos for the almana from that which was inherited. Similar to what we discussed earlier. But now the boss gets married and all her possessions now accrue to the Baal. Does the almana still have rights to collect from her mizonos, excuse me, from the estate that now belongs to the Baal? And the Pashtus, if not for a special Takana, she would now lose, she, the Almona, would now lose her rights to collect his own. Why? Because if the estate is sold to a buyer, she does not have what's called a shibu, a lien on that estate. Because could you imagine, would you ever buy a field or a piece of real estate knowing that possibly the seller will die and his almana will now come and take with a shibu, take those nechassim. So Rabbana made a takana that to protect the lekuchos, they're not going to allow for that shibu. They won't recognize the shibu. She would vis-a-vis -vis the almana and therefore the almana will no longer be able to collect her mizonos once the field is sold to a loke. And Pashtus, when a man marries a woman, and now through the, through the uh, super relationship, he now in, inherits, so to speak, all of her possessions. Again, there's a difference between goof and bears and so forth and so on. So then his status should be that of a loke. And therefore, when she, the almana, comes to collect her mizonos from his newly acquired estate through marriage, he has a right to say to her, go fly a kite. You don't have, there's nothing, there's no shibud in these nechassim for you. So the Rabbana made a takon in order to protect the sustenance of the almana. They said that the Baal who marries the daughter, right, her son-in-law, has the status not of a lokeach, but of a yorish. And as we said before, vis-a-vis Yerusha, she will collect her mizonos. So that's what it says, Yalmanoso Mizones Minachosov, based on this Takonis Chachamin. A woman can collect her mizonos. This Almana will collect her mizonos, although she cannot collect it from a Lokeach, but she can collect it from the Baal. And the reason for this is because Lokeach spent a lot of money to buy this, and now he. You know, you're telling him he has to fork it over to the to the almana, so he wasted all his money, lost all his money. You're going to discourage any buying and selling of kaka in the, in the, in the market. But in the case of the Baal, what dime did he invest in acquiring ownership on his newly wedded wife and her possessions? Nothing. He didn't lift a finger. He didn't sink in a dime. So he doesn't suffer any loss. It's all pure gain. And therefore, the almana has the rights to collect her mizonos. And the takana is that the Baal doesn't have the status of a lokeach, but rather of a yorish. So now the Gemara says, a kalachomer. Who the ishno mi boy? In a case where a man is alive, or Hashem, his wife is alive, and he wrote off his nechassim to one of his children, how much more so the Bunim cannot be considered Lukukos. Lukukos means they spent a lot of money investing in the purchase. They didn't purchase anything. They didn't spend a dime. How much more so the father and the mother during the, their lifetime should be able to collect their Mizonos from the, from the so-called Yerucha. I mean, it's not really Yerucha. It was an outright gift. It's a lot. Of, you, you and I know that in order to avoid tax laws, you, you give away gifts. Gifts are not as taxable as Yerusha. You know, inheritance tax could be very odd. Shalach Ravin Bigarta, Ravin sent a letter. Misha Mace Vihiniach. One second, I lost it here. I turned two pages instead of one. Misha Mace Vihiniach. Almana Ubas. 
right? He died and he left behind him and I wanted a boss. He has only one daughter. She inherits his possessions. And now, Almanoso Nizonos Minachosov. And Nise Sabas, Almanoso Nizonos Minachosov. Even if she gets married, in which case we should consider the Baal as a Lokeach. No, we're going to consider the Baal as a Yoresh. And she, the Almono, will continue to, to uh, collect Hamizonos from the Arusha. Oh, but now we get to a more complicated case. Mesa Habas. You see, as long as the Bas was alive, then her husband is not a Yoresh. He gains her possessions through the vehicle of marriage, of Nietzsche's. And therefore, we could say he's not, you know, he, he's, he's in a different, uh, different category. But now she dies. Now she dies. The Baal now inherits all her possessions because Abal Yorich is each them. He's an alien to the picture now. He's no longer married to the boss. And now the Almona is going to come and take away from his inheritance through the Takanis Ksub of the Almona. And I'll just read to you, he says the following Mesa Abbas Vinimta Baila Yorich called Nachos, the Klaal Nachos Melish and Ofla Birusha Meavio, who may at the age loader and Timcha Tamshi Halmona Little and Zorosea Meanachos. The boss is out of the picture, she died. Can the Almona still continue to collect for her Mizonos from the Ba? No matter Shabal ki ish nachriu, to we say that the Baal is like an alien person? Shari bol in a chosin machmas ish to below machmas av. He has no relation to the father. This is his wife's possessions that he inherits after her death. Is ain who elikol okech the alma? We should consider him as a lokech. We say that the alma has no rights to collect from lokech. This is no shivu. Om Rabbi Yehuda ben Achoso, Shel Rabbi Yossi bar Chanina, Al Yodi, Hayamaisa. As I had a case where I had to judge this, the Amru and the Chachamim told me to be mora halacha that Al Menaso Nizonis bin Achos. Even in this case, the Almona continues to be supported even after the death of her daughter from the estate that's now been inherited by her husband. Boy. Now again, the same Talachom. In a case where he gave over his Nechassim, the father, as a gift to his son during his lifetime, I need a Chiddush to say that he, the father, and his wife can still collect their Mizonos from the properties that he bequeathed to the son as a gift. And the Gemara answers, "Mao de tema hasam who de lekol itarach aval hachal ledi day nitrach ledi day ledi da etc." In the case of a man who died, leaving a daughter and his wife, his almon, he's out of the picture. He's gone already. You cannot expect him to support his late wife if he's dead. So therefore, we had to make a takana to allow the Almada to collect her mizonos from his estate and not starve to death, even if that estate was inherited after the death of the daughter by the Baal. But in the case where a man is alive and well, and he bequeaths all his possessions to his son, this is not a dire situation. This is not, you know, do a do a die. Let him go out and get a job. Support himself and his wife. And that's called Nitrach Lidi Deu Lidi Da. Mashmalon, that this Takana 
even when the father is alive, still applies that he and his wife can collect the mizonos from the estate that he's now bequeathed as a gift to his son. Ibailu hilchasakavase, less hilchasakavase. How do we paskin? Do we accept Allah like Rabbi Law? And if a man gives all his possessions as a gift to his son during his lifetime, he and his wife can still support themselves from that estate, Toshma, to Rabbi Hanina, Rabbi Yonas, and Abu Kaime. So Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi Yonas were together. And also Gavra, and a man comes in, Gachin ben Ashkel Rabbi Yonasan Bekari. And this man kisses Rabbi Yonasan on his knees. That's a sign of respect, of, of gratitude. Amal lay Rabbi Hanina. So Rabbi Hanina turns to Rabbi Yonasan. He says, My high, well, why did this guy kiss your leg? Amal lay Rabbi Yonasan responds that this person was, quote, a kosev nechas of Lebanavu. He gave all his possessions as a gift to his children. And now we turn to Dafnun Amir Aleph. V'asinu lizanek. And I forced the children, or the son, whatever it is, to support the father and his wife. And because I did so, he came in to kiss me because he owed me a debt of gratitude. Because this wasn't really the letter of the law. This was what we call Lifnim Mishra Sadbin. So I understand why he kissed him, he kissed his knees. If I assume that this is not Mikra Din, but it was Lifnim Mishra Sadbin, Mishum Hachi Asinu. If you're going to tell me, that according to the strict letter of the law, like Rabbi Lyon told us, that the father has rights to take from his possessions that he gave over to his son, is I sinu, boy? You know, did, did Rabbi Yonah said have to say, well, I'm going to force you, you know, to the son, you know, to support your father. That's the Iker Adin. So there's no Lephlebetrus Adin here, and there's no reason for him to show gratitude. So we see from this that the halacha is not like Rabbi La. And if a person writes all his nachas into his ponim, they have an absolute, unconditional, no strings attached ownership, acquisition of ownership on these nachas. They don't have to give a dime, neither to the live father, neither to the live mother. And ein ha'isha ve'av mizonim me. And this leads us to another Takonas Usha, which Bulineder, Bezer Hashem, will pick up tomorrow. Omar Rav Ila. And I wish you a great day. Thank you, sir.